hello, welcome. Uh, my name is John Damra. I'm an assistant librarian for access and outreach services here at the library. Uh, I'm joined on, in chat uh, by Vivian Milzarski, our library director. And on behalf of uh, us and Evan Markover, uh, associate professor of biology uh, here at MSMC, uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, so today, uh, just a few reminders, do keep yourself muted, phones muted today. Uh, if you're joining us for FYE credit on Zoom, please put your MSMC ID number, uh, your name and your email into the chat. Uh, we have enabled live transcripts, so if you do need that as an option, it is available to you as well. Um, so uh, welcome again to IROC. Uh, today, uh, I get to welcome uh, Nicole M. Arco and just a little bit about uh, Nicole. He graduated from Mount St. Mary College in 2016 with a BA in psychology and attended SUNY New Paltz from 2017 to 2019, graduating with an MA in psychology while teaching as an adjunct at MSMC. Uh, she also worked as a research and data manager for a nonprofit after school program. She's currently obtaining a PhD from U Albany in cognitive psychology as a member of the visual cognition lab. In describing the context for her research, she says, as an avid reader and lifelong pianist, I've also always been interested in the similarities between these ostensibly different cognitive feats and how they might be related to one another. Entering the visual cognition lab, I began to focus on eye movements and what they can tell us about where and when we move our eyes during different tasks. Nicole's research involves examining music reading and text reading using eye tracking. Uh, this includes the study of expertise and whether those skills are domain general or domain specific, as well as chunking theory pertaining to music. This work is leading to the subject of her dissertation, which will extend to include a cross-model visual search paradigm. That's a lot of words for me. Nicole, welcome. Thank you. Just let me get my notes set up. Um, so today I'm just going to be discussing some results from a reanalysis of an eye tracking data that was collected a few years ago on music expertise by Maturian Sheridan 2020. Oh, sorry, too many. Um, so I'm first going to provide some background information on eye movements, and then I'll discuss the Maturian Sheridan uh, methodology. Um, I'll discuss the results of the reanalysis and then talk about some future directions that I'm taking. So I'll introduce some key concepts in the eye tracking literature, and then I'll provide some background information on the expertise literature as well. So in text reading, eye movements are composed of saccades, which are the movements, and fixations, which are periods uh, when the eye is relatively still. Uh, new information is obtained during the fixation and suppressed during saccades. The eyes move so that fine grain information needed for reading can be viewed with foveal vision, where the vision is most clear. And I'll show you a, a diagram on the next slide. Skilled English readers tend to fixate uh, for approximately 250 milliseconds and have an average saccade length of about two degrees, which is about five or seven letters. In music reading, skilled musicians tend to land on the white spaces surrounding the notes for approximately 375 milliseconds. And they have an average saccade length of about one degree, and this is about one and a half notes. So as you can see, the fovea uh, is the location where readers have the highest visual acuity, and it's approximately one degree of visual angle in each direction from the point of fixation. Directly outside of the fovea is the parafoveal vision, and vision is less clear, and uh, the, it extends approximately one to five degrees uh, visual angle from the point of fixation. And then lastly, the peripheral region is everything beyond the parafoveal region. And as you can see, uh, vision is even less clear. So from the point of fixation, which is indicated by the fixation cross, skilled English readers obtain information asymmetrically. This means they, they attain about three to four character spaces to the left, which is in orange, and then 14 to 15 character spaces to the right of fixation, which is in blue. Um, this is referred to as the perceptual span. So in music reading, skilled, mu uh, skilled musicians' perceptual span is approximately uh, one, one bar of music. 
Uh, so it's more than two beats, but less than four. So this would be a, an approximate fixation test. Or per, I'm sorry, perceptual span. So due to the fact that we only attend to a small perceptual span, we need to frequently move our eyes. And eye movements are a good index of where we are paying attention to from moment to moment. So by examining eye movements, we can observe how people allocate their attention as a covert measure. What this means is that eye movements can reveal information that we're not aware of. A wide range of measures can be used to tell us more about uh, the allocation of attention. And here I was focusing on fixation locations and fixation durations of expert musicians. Eye movements can reveal how expert and novices attend in qualitatively different ways. Uh, chunking theory, which I'll describe on the next slide, is one basis for how experts and novices process information differently. The eye-mind link is that connection between, the, uh, uh, between eye movements and cognition that's required for many tasks. Eye movements are a useful indicator of cognitive and perceptual processing and provide information about how people allocate their attention as a function of time. Expertise can refer to uh, several domains in which an individual has developed specific skills, knowledge, uh, and abilities. Some of these skills and abilities include perception, memory, attention, and decision-making. One question within the expertise uh, literature is, are these skills domain general? So can they transfer to other domains or are they domain specific? Are these skills uh, applicable only to an area of expertise? Domains of expertise that have been examined range from sports, art, medicine, chess, reading, and music. Chunking theory um, provides a possible explanation for why experts sh uh, show domain-specific performance advantages. Chunks refer to meaningful patterns of visual domain-specific information. And over the course of many hours of practice within their domains, experts um, form memory representations uh, you know, for these chunks. So in other words, experts learn how to recognize specific patterns and then recall these patterns of features as opposed to focusing on individual components. So for example, in chess, uh, uh, expert players learn how to encode patterns of, that group multiple chess pieces together as opposed to individual chess pieces. So if, if you look at this image here on the very top is an example of an expert. They're fixating in the center of the pattern um, able to group those pieces together, whereas intermediate and novices are fixating on individual chess pieces. Another example can be seen here. Um, these images represent scan paths. So uh, the pattern the eye is making during this search um, of expert radiologists on the very top. And as you can see, compared to novices, um, ex expert radiologists are able to focus on the relevant information. So just to give you an example of, of a chunk that you might be able to, to understand more in your daily life, um, I'm gonna show you a series of numbers very quickly. And I want you to try and recall as many numbers as possible in the order in which you see them. So very quick, hopefully I don't uh, click too, uh, too fast. Okay. Um, and then you could just uh, call out the numbers. Okay, was anyone able to recall any of those numbers? Okay, oh, that's good, that, this is excellent. Okay, so I'm gonna do it uh, one more time. Okay, I'm hearing, uh, I'm hearing some, I think I'm hearing more numbers this time. Uh, so I have one more example, this time with letters. Okay, and last time. Okay, great. I, so I, I did hear uh, more numbers the second time when you saw them. So, oh, let me just go down. So as you can see, I, um, you know, the numbers were easier to remember when they were uh, grouped together to form a chunk, which in this case are, are meaningful units, their dates. Uh, instead of trying to remember an you know individual uh, twenty different numbers, um, and then the same idea applies to the acronyms as well. So there has been extensive work exploring chunking in chess, 
but it's still unknown what constitutes a chunk in music, but there are some ideas in the literature. So one potential source of chunking is rhythm and the temporal structure of music. So for example, if you look at the top left corner, um, one study identified that novices focus on smaller chunks or more like half measures, which is circled in red. And expert, uh, or sorry, the, these were amateurs would rely on larger chunks. So as you can see, more like a whole measure circled in blue. Uh, so another potential source of chunking could be chord patterns, so which is seen at the top. And then another study suggested that uh, the beam, so this is the horizontal bar connecting multiple notes, could be indicative of a chunk in musical expertise. So beaming not only groups notes in a rhythmic pattern, but also potentially facilitates visual perception uh, in expert musicians. Beaming uh, also might be related to contour, which is the pattern of up and down in music uh, related to pitch. And this could be another potential source of chunking in music. So the current analysis uh, will help us understand how musicians are allocating their attention while processing musical scores. So as I mentioned, this is a reanalysis of Maturian Sheridan 2020 study. So I will now go over the methodology. Uh, so there were equal sample sizes of expert and non-musicians. Uh, expert musicians had to have at least 10 years of musical training. And this, uh, this training was either through private lessons um, or practicing at least three hours a week. And non-musicians self-reported uh, little or no musical training and that they could not, not read music. So, oh, right uh, so materials consisted of 108 three-line excerpts from lesser known Baroque and classical, um, classical era piano scores. Each of the three-line excerpts contained a target and two distractor regions. And they're outlined here for the demonstration, but the participants did not see those uh, during the study. These regions were chosen randomly um, and each target only appeared once in a given uh, search array. Uh, counterbalancing was used so that the target and distractor regions uh, were equally located on one of the three lines. So using eye tracking, a fixation cross was displayed um, and they would press a button then to begin each trial. So the, during each trial, the template, which is at the top, was displayed directly above the three line search array. They had to find locate the target. Participants were instructed to locate the target as quickly and accurately as possible. Once they located, they were asked to fixate on it and press a button. The eye tracker then located the fixation during the, uh, or, uh, when they pressed the button and then the screen would advance to the next trial. So I'll give you an example. Um, so if there's any musicians and non-musicians, maybe we can see if um, someone is able to locate it faster. So they would see a fixation cross. And then just, if you see it, you can raise your hand. Okay. Are any of you musicians? Okay. Uh, so just for those of you that weren't able to locate it, uh, it's right here at the bottom. So that's uh, just to give you an idea of what the participants um, would uh, explore. So our predictions were that there would be qualitatively different patterns for expert and non-musicians. Since chunking and chest impacts fixation location and that they land near the middle of a pattern, we hypothesize that expert musicians would fixate in the center of a pattern um, and have, long, <clears throat> excuse me, have longer durations near the center of a pattern. So for the results, we focused on proportion of fixations and the fixation duration, so how long they fixated. So these are examples um, from, uh, from the trial, one expert and one non-musician participant. So these heat maps represent the count density and the duration. So it, it's a visualization of the proportion of fixation duration and the fixation count relative to the total trial. 
So as you can see uh, for the expert, they focus more densely near the, the bar line, as you can see in the red for the search template and the target, which is directly below it. Um, so non-musicians on the other hand, uh, as you can see, they fixated uh, for a high amount of uh, fixation uh, on the search template kind of in the middle and then scanned most of the entire uh, search array below. So this would suggest that experts are able to focus on relevant information during the search in order to locate the target bar. Um, so I have a video trial and actually I forgot to make sure the audio works because I have a little audio at the end, but um, so hopefully this works. Um, if you focus on the pink dot, this is an expert trial. You'll be able to see what their eye was doing during this trial. Um, and then I have one more video. This is of a, of a non-musician. So again, if you just focus on the pink dot, this will show you um, the scan path their eye was doing during the trial. Okay, so was anyone able to see any um, differences between those two? Okay, does anyone know, wanna explain what they saw? Yeah. Okay, great. Does anyone have anything to add or anything different that they observed? Okay, great. Yeah, so, so these eye movement patterns did reflect what Maturi and Sheridan 2020 reported. Um, so experts were able to encode the information from that template um, and, you know, more efficiently and form it into a meaningful pattern, which then helped guide their search um, for the target within the search array. Uh, Non-musicians, as you uh, saw, had to make frequent comparisons. So their eye went back and forth from the template back to the search array many times um, to make a comparison until they were able to locate the target. Um, so we did a more fine grained analysis on landing location. And to analyze the data, we divided each bar into four quartiles um, along the horizontal axis. Um, if you look at the graph, the red stars, oh, this might be easier for me. Uh, the red stars indicate significance below 0.05. Um, and on the y-axis, we have proportion of fixations, and on the x-axis, the four quartiles. Um, experts are depicted with the blue bars and non-musicians with the gray bars. Uh, so expert musicians fixated significantly uh, more in the first quartile and the fourth quartile. So in these locations here. Um, on the other hand, non-musicians fixated significantly more in the second quartile. Uh, so these results suggest that the experts are fixating closer to the bar lines with their parafoveal processing extending across the bar line. We also analyze the fixation durations uh, for the four quartiles as well. So here you'll see on the y-axis fixation duration in milliseconds, and then again the four quartiles on the x-axis. Um, and then again, the uh, experts are in the blue bars and non-musicians in the gray. Um, so as you can see, experts fixated significantly longer in the first quartile and the fourth quartile compared to non-musicians. So because they're fixating for longer durations near the bar lines, it's possible that they're chunking uh, these nodes into a meaningful pattern. So I'll talk about what these fixation patterns mean and um, how this relates to what we know about viewing locations. So taken together, this line of work indicates that eye tracking can help reveal the cognitive mechanisms underlying expertise 
in the music domain. So specifically, these results suggest that expert musicians have a specific fixation pattern that are consistent with previous literature. So in chess literature, experts tend to land near the edges, closer to the center of a chunk, suggesting that they are able to encode more information into meaningful patterns or chunks within their domain. In music pattern, uh, I'm sorry, in music reading, this pattern is seen when the musicians are fixating near a bar line and the pattern is extending across the bar line. Experts in music have larger proportions of fixations in the white areas of, of music score, so they're not focusing on individual notes, which is also similar in chess. So it seems that experts have a specific viewing locations within their domain, and this is something that we see in reading literature. So uh, this yellow line is uh, approximately in the center of the words, and the preferred viewing location in text reading is slightly to the left of the center of a word, so where this fixation cross would be. So one thought is that readers aim for the middle of the word or what is known as the optimal viewing location, but due to ocular motor error, they fall short and land in the preferred viewing location. So although the preferred viewing location and optimal viewing location have only been observed in the reading literature, it's possible that a similar pattern um, is observed in music reading, uh, and this could be related to attention. So one study observed fixation positions for a three note music sequence, and they compared experts, intermediate and novice musicians. In the study, they manipulated where the participants would fixate. And if the participants eyes moved away from this um, fixation position, the trial would end. Um, and it, so they had these different positions. Um, and these results found that experts had an advantage in the left fixation position, whereas novices and intermediates seemed to prefer the center fixation. Uh, one interpretation for these findings is that since novices prefer the center fixation, that uh, the expert musician's years of musical training tends to shift their fixation advantage to the left. So again, consistent with chunking theory, experts are processing in qualitatively different ways, which is indicative of the greater proportions of fixations at the start of the bar lines, as you can see um, the blue. Um, and they're also for longer durations. And this allows them to efficiently attend to and then chunk that information into a meaningful pattern. So there's still more work um, to see what chunking is in music and if chunks do extend across the bar lines and to the extent to which they extend across the bar lines. Some future directions that I'm working on now is to extend the Maturi and Sheridan 2020 into a cross-modal visual search paradigm. And I'll give you an example in the next slide. So this study will incorporate an audio template uh, manipulation as well as a visual, visual. So it's well known that musicians have superior auditory skills uh, compared to non-musicians. Therefore, I'm hypothesizing that chunking in music is multimodal. Uh, I'm predicting that expert musicians will perform at a higher accuracy the visual search um, compared to novice musicians, which is a replication from the Maturi and Sheridan 2020. And this will be magnified in the auditory condition. So the visual search will be conducted sequentially, which means they're going to see the template or hear the template. And then on the next screen, they'll see the search array. Um, and hope I, I forgot to check the audio, but let's see if this works. So they would hear something like this um, and then have to search for that as well. Another future direction is extending the boundary paradigm in music. And again, I'll show you an example on the next slide. Um, to date, the boundary paradigm has never been explored in music reading. So by extending this paradigm to music reading, we can further examine the mechanisms in music reading and how expert musicians chunk how they're allocating their attention and how much paraphobial processing um, expert musicians are engaging in. So the boundary paradigm provides information about the preview um, benefit that's obtained in reading. So specifically how much and what type of information is being perceived in the paraphobial vision. So paraphobial processing is information obtained from word n plus one and it can facilitate identification of this word. So for example, if you're focused on word N, and then this first line is the word that, how much information are you getting from the, the word N plus one? So how much information are you getting from the word readers? So the boundary paradigm uses eye tracking and creates an invisible boundary to the left of the target word. And in this example here, the target word is viewers. 
on every other line. And the target word uh, when it's a preview, so when they're fixated on that, the word n plus one, there's tip it's typically replaced using three different manipulations. So the first two lines show that they replace it with another word that makes sense in the context of the sentence. Uh, the next two lines, they replace it with um, a non-word that resembles the target word orthographically, because you can see this kind of resembles the word viewers. And then the last two line, uh, they'll replace it with a random letter string. So when the eyes move past this invisible boundary, that preview, so either uh, this non, uh, the non-word letter string, the orthographically similar or the semantically similar word is then replaced with the target word. And in this case, it's viewers. Um, and they'll do that replacement during the saccades. Um, the results of this paradigm suggest that if readers have a valid preview of the word to the right of fixation, then they will fixate less on this word compared to a non-word or a random letter string. Uh, lastly, future directions include addressing the larger question to the extent of which these expert skills are domain general or domain specific. So for example, chunking may be a domain specific skill, but perhaps um, pattern recognition or their search strategy is a domain general skill. So we need to understand the boundary conditions. And one way is by looking at dual experts. So for example, expert musicians and expert readers. Um, this could help understand if expertise in music reading could help with text reading or what of these skills from music reading is uh, generally applied to text reading. So this work informs basic visual and ocular motor processing, attention and decision making. And visual search has application because researchers are also interested in how we can learn to quickly recognize objects, including complex objects. Uh, one example is um, it could be applied to TSA agents who have to uh, quickly search for potential threats. Another area that this research is applicable to is in video game expertise. Um, so how some, some games, players need to quickly search for and locate useful items during a game. And then lastly, there's a, a link to artificial intelligence as well. So understanding human intelligence can help with developing systems for um, artificial intelligence. And if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Anybody in the room have any questions that they'd like to ask today? Excellent. Here is a question. Great. Hello. I can hear you fine, but I'm, I'm sure that's for the yeah. for the Zoom, the camera, right? Now it's on. <laughs> now I am on. Thank you, Nicole, for your <laughs> oh, presentation sure. um, and for providing some. Uh, su application suggestions at the end. I, I, as you were going through your presentation, I was thinking, how can this be uh, applied to those who design scores for musicians? Has has that been discussed? And do you have thoughts? Um, I haven't actually thought about um, designing scores, but that's an, that's a great um, area to look into. Um, something that, that we've talked about um, in my lab is how understanding how experts are allocating their attention would help. Um, in teaching music, so teaching them how to recognize patterns. Um, that's probably the best answer I can give you right now, but that's an excellent suggestion. Yeah. Any other questions from our audience members in the chats? I have a question for you. Okay, great. That may not be informed directly by this research, but you might know from the Visual Cognition Lab uh, as a glasses wearer myself. <laughs> I'm very curious about how uh, I get, you know, for lack of better terms, ocular acuity and visual acuity of, would affect the ability to chunk. Um, if that is something that, that has come up in any of your research or your study, uh, do people with 2020 vision chunk better or faster? Or oh, that's an, yeah, we have not pursued uh, that line of research um, as far as how that plays. We usually typically um, recruit participants that have either normal or corrected to normal. So um from my understanding the glasses usually do the trick but that's a great question thank, thank you, you.